Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Science Mind class. We have a few folks coming into the room and we're happy for those of you who are with us online. I'm Dr. Petra and we are wandering through this section of the um, book. We're on mysticism and um, we have been talking about evolution, how evolution the yeah. picturing of the impulse of life itself. And so we're on the top of page uh, 340. Um, and we're talking about this idea that evolution is the outpicturing of the impulse of life itself. That the very intelligence and impulse of life is moving through creation and evolving it. And that that impress is for more life. But the way that it evolves is organized and governed by universal principles and laws. And so the um, evolution is the time and process through which spirit unfolds, through which spirit and life unfold into form. Um, and that unfolding process, that creative process is governed by law. And that law is something that we can use and understand um, and trust, really. So I love this. Um, While there is liberty in the evolving principle, it is always in accord with certain fundamental laws of necessity. And um, so that, that's what causes that evolution to be orderly and progressive and, and, and using universal principles. So. Um, I love this thought. I think I love the way that this is described. It seems as though behind evolution, there is an irresistible pressure compelling more, better, higher, and greater things. This irresistible pressure, the impulse of life itself, compelling more, better, higher, and greater things. And so Ernest Holmes uses as an example, he uses locomotion. He uses travel as an example for this, right? So if we study the evolution of locomotion from the rising of uh, human, human beings, we see him riding upon a horse, then in a cart, in a wagon, and so on to the automobile and the airplane. What is this but the evolution of locomotion, right? Each one builds on the next in an orderly, lawful manner, but the impress is the idea of how do I get from here to there, right? That's the impulse. And I keep wanting better ways to get from here to there. So what is the inevitable? Oh, and he says, talks about in, in ships, we would see the same thing, right? That's all land locomotion. And then, of course, air locomotion. Then we went to you know, space. And then um, um, ships, you can see the same thing, right? From canoe raft to canoe to all the different ways, all the way, you know, what are, what are those ones that rise up on the water? The What are they called? The hydro? hydrofoil, right? And they scoot across the water, right? So, so the, this evolutionary process is the impress of life seeking more and greater and better expression of the idea of how do I get from here to there? What is the inevitable end of locomotion? What do you think the inevitable end of locomotion would be? You arrive Great, but how do you get there? Because locomotion is how you get from here to there. What's the inevitable end of that evolutionary process? By location, right? That that and and that's exactly what that's exactly where Ernest Holmes goes with it because it makes complete sense. Could it be? Could it be other than that we shall ultimately do away with every means, every visible means of transportation? We shall have so unified unified with omnipresence that we shall ourselves be omnipresent. When we shall have arrived at a sufficient understanding, our thought will take us where we wish to go. So we can continue to see that it's evolving, that, and, and yet still under the, um, the lawful universe, universal principles of there are ways to get from here to there, and they build upon each other. And the more that we know, the more sophisticated, the more complex, um, the ways in which we get from here to there become, um, and the more ultimately 
they reveal our understanding of the laws, right? Isn't that what the Wright brothers did? Is they focused on, they had to learn about the laws of aerodynamics to fly. But as those understanding, as that understanding grew, then we could have all kinds of faster and uh, flight and then flight that leaves the atmosphere and flight that goes out into space and all because our understanding of the laws and principles have developed. So if we move into, we, if we understand the same thing and we move into the understanding of spiritual laws, then everything that we do will evolve according to the spiritual laws beyond even just the manipulation of the natural laws. And so, yeah. And so this is why we don't want to be confused by the idea that this irresistible pressure is compelling more, better, higher, and greater things. We don't want to confuse that with the American dream or with the, um, the economic system that has caused us to be dissatisfied with everything that we have. And we always have to have more and more and more right? It's not more acquisition. It's more expression of a particular idea. In this case, the idea of transportation. And I think this becomes really important when we recognize that it's not, it's not about, um, yeah, it's not about this, this constant push towards what do we get? It, this more and better and greater is always the push of what do we express? How much life are we expressing? How much more are we able to do or contribute? Um, and uh, how much more of the laws, the universal principles do we understand? So we've been talking in this chapter about evolution, right? And we're in the chapter of what the mystics have taught, which has always seemed very strange to me that the chapter on evolution, the section on evolution would be in the chapter of mysticism. And yet here we come to the next section on cosmic consciousness illumination, because it is in that place of oneness when we know oneness and we know how the universal principles of oneness operate that bilocation becomes possible, right? That, the, that we are then operating from those universal principles. We're not just trying to learn them. We're not just trying to apply them. We actually have moved to the place where we're operating from them in that place of cosmic consciousness. So we might ask ourselves, what is cosmic consciousness? Which is of course in alignment with this, um, chapter on mysticism, cosmic consciousness being that full awareness of our oneness, to live in that state of oneness, to live in that state where we are conscious of the infinite reality. And we're conscious of um, how it operates and what that means about the truth of us. An inner awareness, a spiritual sense Ernest Holmes is quoting Swedenborg, and he goes on to quote quite a number of people um, um, and talk about what different people who, you know, what do I want to say, validate or give credibility to cosmic consciousness. And then he'd go, and then we go on to, to examine what is cosmic consciousness or, and how do we engage in that experience of omnipresence? So he differentiates, we differentiate from the impress or the um, instinct that we have with our animal nature. Animals have instinct, they know how to move around the cabin, they know how to get what they want, do what they have. Certainly they have feelings and consciousness. But in the evolved or self-aware state, there's then also intuition that is open to that infinite impress and recognizes that in infinite impress and experiences it in some form or fashion, right? The still small voice, the nudge, the, 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 well, I don't always want to say the nudge because sometimes that's actually instinctive, 
And sometimes that's actually our psychic awareness. So really it's the awareness or the experience of the impress of life, of how life is seeking to express itself as us individually and as we see it in the macrocosm. Yeah. So, so we might want to ask ourselves then, well, first of all, let's go back to this idea that if in any area of life, we were to experience omnipresence, that our use, uh, that our um, hmm, movement, no, I don't want to say movement, that our engagement with the physical world would be radically different, right? Because our engagement in the physical world would be radically different if we could bilocate and didn't have to go outside and get in a, get in a vehicle and drive somewhere or take a plane or take a train or walk even, right? It would be radically altered. So we re really stop and think about how, what would it be like to live from that place where everything becomes radically altered because we're living from the place of omnipresence. We could do that as a thought experiment, right? What would that be like? So we have two questions on the table. What would it be like if we were experiencing omnipresence? How would that alter our life experience? And the second one is, what in the world is cosmic consciousness? Have you experienced it? How would you express it? Because those would be two sides of the same coin. So we're going to stop there. We have a few people in the room, so you're welcome to raise your hand if you have a comment or a question. Um, we also have some folks online, so we're going to turn to Ryan, and we're going to let you say hello to those folks online and invite them into the conversation. Thank you. Good morning, sure. Ryan. And uh, thank you for everybody who's here joining us in the room. And for those who are online and on Facebook Live, we appreciate you for being with us here today as well. And as Peter mentioned, we are in an engaging class. This is what we're here for, right? To engage in conversation. And so there's a few ways to do that. Uh, those who are in the room, just loudly. I have these oh, microphones. As I can also see. give them the mic, which is. Or she can hand you the mic, whatever you prefer. It's just so that way we can all experience a better sense of your question. Um, and for those who are online, if you would like to join us in the Zoom room, I put the link in the description above. And for those who are in the Zoom room, all you have to do is hit the raise your hand icon and I can call you into the room. And as always, you can fit your questions, comments inside the chat. And the same goes true for those on Facebook Live. And uh, for those who are coming with us online, I just want to mention I keep it anonymous so that way we can continue to provide a safe container of spiritual growth. <laughs> Yay, thank you, Ryan. But I did see it. So should we start there? Hi, Randy. Yeah, so uh, I just had a thought that um, along the lines of evolution of, of, of locomotion, it would seem that um, possibly the, um, <clears throat> the Zoom society that we have established and, the, and now uh, the virtual reality um, technology that's coming about is, could be considered you know, an evolution of that impress to bilocate or become omnipresent. Concept, right? That we can actually be together. We can actually be together across the miles. Um, and, and rather than having to get into something and, dr and drive there, fly there, whatever, you, we just get online together. It's another way of being, of being in the same place, right? Which is a great, what's, what an interesting concept. And that that would be the evolution of that. Um, and um, while we might not have decided it's something that we want to do on Moss because of the pandemic, right? We all sort of ended up there and yet it was still done according to 
the and in sort of a orderly unfolding of learning about what programs work best what platforms work best how does this all work right it may have felt chaotic but it's not random and it's not just sort of out of the blue it's a natural evolution of things that are going along that's a great idea and then of course virtual reality we actually we actually are someplace else, or we experience being someplace else, and we never have to leave our room. So we're starting to actually experience what that might be like. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And the internet has, has connected us. It always has seemed to me a way of connecting us that mirrors this um, connection that we have in the, in the spiritual intangible side of life. All right, so Ryan, let's come to you. And what is going on out there? Um, love to see if there are any comments and questions online. Well, uh, what I'm seeing a lot of is people referring to omnipresence examples of that in nature, a lot of references to water. Uh, there's a never ending supply of water. And if you think about it, it cycles through so on and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of different examples. Uh, right now, I don't see anybody's hand raised up in okay, the Zoom. Great. So I think we're ready to go a little bit further. Good. So thank you. So one of the places we can start is to look in the natural world and see these ideas, uh, see the idea of omnipresence out pictured. But the real question is, when have you experienced omnipresence? When have you experienced that idea, that experience of being part of the whole, being in a state where, I don't know, I guess I'm, I don't want to prime the pump too much with um, words, right? But um, that's, what would omnipresence feel like? What would it feel like and look like? Ryan, let's see what's out there. Yeah, so first, I'd like to call into the room, Brenda, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, Brenda? Good morning, Brenda. Good morning, Dr. Petra and community. Well, interesting question, my experience. Uh, give us it... one second here, Brenda, just hold on one second, please. There are so many buttons and dials that have to be pushed and set up. <laughs> so Ryan now has to check the connections. Because we'd love to talk with you. Hmm? Hello? Hello? We're going to have to do Hello? a little, a little I'll check. I'll come right back to you right. who are here with us in the Zoom good thanks ryan yeah so think about the this idea of omnipresence right and so so it's really interesting that ernest holmes he he um he quotes a lot of people right he quotes swedenborg and then he quotes a person who was apparently a, a writer in the anglican church at the time that he was writing this so this would have been in the 1920s this man named dean inga and he writes about plotinus it was one of the great Neoplatonists and all the experiences of cosmic consciousness that he has. Then he quotes somebody, Dr. Buck, who made, a, who wrote a book on cosmic consciousness. And, and I think the reason that he does this just in his own book is that we're reticent to believe, to postulate that we might ourselves have those experiences. I think it's really important to really think about, not just to be able to see it out there or to read about it in a book, but to begin to recognize what does it mean when we're in those moments. So for me, I have a number of different words that come to my mind when I recognize that I'm having an experience of omnipresence. Not of an omnipresence, right? I want to be clear about that, but of omnipresence, right? That, that I am a part of that omnipresence. 
And so, so for me, when I think about those experiences, a number of things I would describe. One, timelessness. Two, a sense that I don't actually know anymore where I end and the universe starts. That there's a permeate, permeable flow and, and there's not a hard and fast, here I am as an individual, there you are as an individual, there's this experience somewhere out there, right? But, but everything is moving all at the same time and I'm a part of that whole thing and I'm experiencing all of that. I, I think of the word flow, right? When I'm, when I'm experiencing life in such a profound flow that it's, yeah, well, I guess we would use the words magical, magical or miraculous, where things unfold in, in ways that not like they're surprising. I don't want to pretend that, I don't want to say that so much as there, it's recognizably outside of anything that I'm consciously figuring out or doing. Of course, omnipresent is an experience we have in meditation. A lot of people don't think of themselves as being good meditators, and they don't think of themselves as having that experience in meditation. Um, and sometimes people will say, well, you want to have an experience of cosmic consciousness, you have to meditate. Uh, I would not agree with that statement. I would not say that meditation is the only way that you can have the experience of cosmic consciousness, not by any means. Meditation is a way where we begin to train our minds about how to shift our awareness into that space. But you don't have to be in the state of meditation to have an experience of cosmic consciousness. The other thing that um, we talk about in the science of mind that Ernest Holmes really stresses in the science of mind is the difference between an experience of omnipresence, an experience of cosmic consciousness, and a psychic experience. Which is why sometimes that word intuition is a little confusing. The other thing that is always present in an, om is a, in an omnipresence or in a cosmic consciousness experience is universality. It's always a universal experience. And we differentiate that from the psychic experience because the psychic experience tends to focus on an individual or a, collect a group of people or an event or, right? And this is not in any way, shape or form deny that psychic experiences happen. But from a science mind point of view, psychic experiences are our ability to read universal subjective mind. They're our ability to engage with subjective mind. They're our abil ability to use other senses that allow us to experience other levels of physicality and expression and thoughts and beliefs um, and expectations that are in subjective mind. And they are generally, actually exclusively, about something in particular. So you can start with Nostradamus's predictions, right? They're specific predictions about something at some point in time. We can talk about our own experiences when we've known who was going to, what we knew or who was on the phone before we even picked it up when we knew not to take that job, or we knew not to turn there, or we had a deep and profound sense that someone needed us and we just happened to call them, right? Do you see how all of those are particular? They're all particular experiences. And so, or when we go to somebody and we ask to um, have any kind of divination done, for our ability to make a decision, understand what might be happening in the future, right? Again, it's particular. It's about our future, or it's about the future of the planet, or it's about the future of a company, right? But it's still always engaged with the particular. And those particulars live in subjective mind. 
uh, Eckhart Tolle, no, sorry, not Eckhart Tolle, not, um, Edgar Casey. that's the name I wanted, Edgar Casey talked about, he called that the Akashic Records. And he literally, when he went into his, um, his trance, his medium trance, he literally understood himself to be walking through the halls of the Akashic Records, because in subjective mind is anything, everything that has ever been thought, everything that's ever been experienced, and the tendency toward which everything is going, which is, of course, when we have precognition and a sense of what might be happening next. Um, but they're always about a particular. Cosmic consciousness is always universal. It's always something that is about life as a whole. It is our experience of life in its fullness, in its totality. It is a recognition of how life works, how the universe is working. It is an awareness, an intuition of a universal principle or law or the way in which life is impressing in, in our life and how, that, and how that is replicated in every other life. The, the experience of cosmic consciousness is not particular. It's not specific about anything, about a particular person. It's about the universe. It's about our awareness of that universal truth, universal presence, universal laws, whatever, whatever it is that we're experiencing in that moment of cosmic consciousness. And, and so that is probably the single biggest identifier of the experience of omnipresence, of cosmic consciousness. When we start growing, expanding, evolving our awareness of, of the universal truths and principles of spirit, of that ultimate reality, when we start really experiencing and evolving into moments of awareness, not just intellectual understanding, but experiential awareness of that. Anytime we're doing that, we are touching the cosmic consciousness experience. And I know that each of us has had some of those. Each and every one of us has had some of those, or you wouldn't be in this room. What we wanna do is to start noticing them recognizing them for, for what they are, because that's our opening to that larger awareness. That's the recognition that there's no place where we stop and the universe starts. There is actually no separation between us and the infinite. And that that is what oneness and omnipresence means. When we have those experiences, we stop talking about, well, a part of me feels human and a part of me knows I'm spiritual, but a part of me feels human. When we have those experiences, we're living from that awareness, even if it's for 30 seconds. We're living from the universal spiritual perspective of the truth of who and what we are. Yeah. And as I said, we have those moments. We don't always recognize them. All right, Ryan, I'm going to come back to you and see if we've solved our te technical stuff. You know what? I, I think I might have a sound effect here for you. Yay. <laughs> I'm going to play that every time she says something magnificent, right? <laughs> so you know that I have this power now. <laughs> So, yeah, I think we do uh, have it fixed, but I wanted to read this. It came in through the chat. I thought it was really appropriate. Great. It says, Om equals name of God. Me equals nothing. Presence equals now. The world tells us that there is nothing between God and now. That's great. I love that. Omnipresence. Yep. Very cool. All right. So, yeah. So let's see. What about you guys in the room? What do you think about this? What is your experience about omnipresence or about cosmic consciousness? 
we can have a long, awkward pause while people in the room or those of you online think about what does that mean to you? I have uh, Connie. Do you want Hi. to go ahead and unmute yourself, Connie? Hi, Connie. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hi. Well, I have a question, uh, and I had a very amazing individual human experience about a week ago. Um, I was in the pottery studio and I realized that I had put another person, another student there. It was a class, a pottery class. Uh, I had put her in a box and I had demarcated all kinds of things about her. And then, and they were negative. And I realized that, you know, assumptions. And I realized that I do that a lot. And um, I'm working through dissipating that and it's a process believe me it's a process because it got wired in pretty pretty severely but um then what happened though um i just happened to come face to face with this person and we started talking and we had the most amazing conversation she speaks spanish and i do too but i'm not totally fluent and um and she taught spanish and we started singing Mexican folk songs in the class. We were just singing them. And it was like this immense connection. And then I realized later in the days following that this was one of my most amazing teachers in this lifetime, this, this experience and this person. Because I'm, I'm almost in tears now talking about it. Because what I realized is that um, everybody is a human being and deserves that respect as a human being and that love and that everything. And um, it opened me up to the, the bigger, bigger picture of how important it is to let go of judgment and just see people and respect them as they are on their path in life. And, oh my goodness, just amazing. And then just one more thing of uh, a couple, well, a couple of places where I experienced what I could call something close to cosmic consciousness is when I am at the wheel in the pottery studio spinning a pot, making a pot, I go into a timeless place. There's no present, there's no future, there's, there's no past, there's no time. And it's blissful, very blissful. I, I know it's just amazing. And then in meditation, I do, you know, I've told you I do transcendental meditation. And, and it's called transcend because we transcend the surface. And we can go to that place of uh, being, he calls it, uh, Maharishi calls it being, but it's not something that we can do. It's something that happens as a result of the meditation. That's it for now. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Yay. Thanks, Connie. How lovely. Right. And anything that reminds us that boxes and labels and judgments are only things that separate us, right? Any kind of awareness like that can, begins to open us to omnipresence, right? Because everybody's a human being, which means everybody's a spiritual being. Everybody's part of the divine. And having those experiences um, in meditation, at the pottery wheel, right? Art is a great place. Any place where there's creativity is a great place to experience these moments. That's why I want to stress, I mean, we usually say, oh, in meditation, but there are so many other ways and places. So thank you, Connie. Okay, I so saw we had a comment online, and then we have one here in the room with Sheila. So Ryan. All right. Anita, would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself and join the conversation? Good morning, Anita. Hey, good morning, Dr. Petra. So, so the experience of the oneness. Right. So it takes me back to thinking about being out at the Grand Canyon and standing on the Yavapai Point at sunrise, looking out over the canyon and the depth of it and the expanse of it. And I just moved into it almost if, as if I was an eagle flying and soaring up and down and through all of that and time and space just went away. But yet, you know, at, at the same time, recognizing how minuscule I am 
in relation to the bigger part of that, mm -hmm. right? So that, that, would, that would probably be my experience. Yes, beautiful. Right. And, and that's a really lovely, what a lovely expression of that. Thank you for sharing that, Anita. Right. And that's, that's the thing about cosmic consciousness is that we don't actually lose our individuality. There is still that kernel of awareness of individuality, that microcosm that can feel very micro compared to the wholeness. And yet there is that part of us that is absolutely experiencing oneness and therefore actually experiencing th that larger experience. Of course, we're not all of that, but we're having an experience of it, a very real expanded, we've expanded into it. And yet we don't lose, there, is, there isn't a loss of individuality here or a loss of the awareness of ourself. We just recognize that in this paradoxical experience, right? We have, and yeah, all the boundaries um, shift and change. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Anita. Sheila. Here, let me bring you this. Actually, I don't know that. How about you come on up here? Oh, we've got a mic right there, too. There you go. Okay. Oh, that one doesn't reach either. We're going to work this out. That's We're all right. Oh, now Can I you can't see now. You. Yep. Uh -huh. I have to say, in my garden, Oh. And most of the time, I'm not here on Sunday because I'm in my garden. Yes. And that's where I have to spend my time because it's therapy for me. Uh -huh. um, so it's individual and it's uh -huh. particular. However, I, I have a t-shirt that says, into my garden I go to lose my mind and find my soul. Yes. And it is so true. I'm, it's timeless. I see the insects, I, I hear the birds, I feel the sunlight, and I'm right there in the moment. Yes. And I don't go off anywhere else. I'm right. right there, but everything seems, seems to come to me. Yes. Beautiful. So, beautiful. Yeah. And so that that's a beautiful expression, Sheila. Thank you so much. So when I speak about the individual and particular in a psychic experience, that's not what you're talking about right? So you are actually having a universal experience in that moment, right? So, so it, it, that's why we don't lose ourself. And sometimes we, we do, we go into the universal and sometimes the universe, we experience and recognize that the universal is just, it comes to us. It's just right here, right? And so this is why it's so important to share these things because there's no one way to have this experience, there's no, and there's no one description of it, right? That's why we have so many mystics. This is not what the mystic knew. This chapter is what the mystics knew. There's many of them. And there's lots and lots and lots of different ways in which it's described and talked about. And of course, some of that's cultural and some of that's um, the language that of the religion that the person is in. But some of it is also, am I in my garden or am I standing on the Grand Canyon? Where, you know, and what kind of a, what kind of expression and experience am I, am I generally having of, of life? And so um, we, um, we definitely have individualized experiences of cosmic consciousness, but it's not about an individual thing, right? Like a psychic experience is, that's the difference. Um, and how beautifully we can recognize that these two experiences would be like reading um, maybe um, Plotinus, who's a Western um, uh, philosopher in the Platonic line, right, and experiencing his cosmic consciousness, and reading um, the Tao Te Ching and having uh, Lao Tzu express his experience of cosmic consciousness from ancient, from the ancient East. And the language is different and the expressions are different. And yet there's a similarity to the experience and a recognition that it is that place where the individual and the universal become aligned and the awareness of the individual and the universal is present, right? 
fully present in some really amazing way. So we might ask ourselves, then how do we cultivate cosmic consciousness? How do we cultivate omnipresence? And, you know, people that people will say, oh, you know, do it in meditation. That's like the catch all answer. And it's true. There, that is very much one way that we can experience it. But really, we can cultivate the experience of cosmic consciousness by walking around in our life, being present to the universal. So Anita was present to the universal standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and therefore invited it in. Whereas Sheila was present to the universal in her garden with the insect and the flower and the digging of the weeds, right? That's, I do a lot of that too. I find a lot of that there, right? I also find it hiking. There's something about rhythmically striding through the woods that opens that doorway for me in, in such a profound way um, that is, is really extraordinary. And so each one of us find that differently, but it is tuning our awareness. It is intending to be present to the universal. So you could right now in this moment where you're sitting in this class, whether you're in the room or you're online, you could ask yourself this moment, this moment. So How's the universe showing up right now? How's the universe showing up right now for you? And you could begin asking yourself that question as you move through your day. What's the universe, what's the universe showing up right now? How's the universe showing up right now? How's this person part of the universe? How's this experience universal? What's universal about what's going on here? Do you see? It's that constant invitation to invite ourselves to see things in that universal reality. And if we contemplate that and bring that question in to our lives over and over and over again, because we, are, we recognize that we know that it's there, we will absolutely continually open ourselves up to these moments of cosmic consciousness. And we'll, really extraordinary things begin to happen. And um, Connie really touched on it, right? When we have that moment, when we're with that person and we're asking ourselves, how is the universe showing up right now? What's universal about this? And all of a sudden, there's a connection with someone that we felt totally disconnected from and we recognize, oh, well, this part person is a part of the one, two. And, and the barriers drop. Do you see in that moment, the barriers drop? Anything that moves us through the sense of separation, invites us into that universal, is inviting us into cosmic consciousness. You can do this. You don't have to be esoteric. You don't have to sit on your meditation cushion. You don't have to have years and years and years of experience, right? Each and every one of us can do this. It is, the, it is, it is what we are paying attention to. Yeah. So we're going to move on over the next week. We're going to uh, invite you to finish reading um, this section on cosmic consciousness um, where he's going to kind of um, continue to describe the difference between cosmic consciousness and um, the psychic experience. We have them both. And um, for those of you who are here on campus uh, today, we have um, a beautiful service coming, coming up, a celebration. Um, I'm going to be talking about busting myths of prosperity. After that, Right here in this room, we're going to have George and Bill Holman talking about their art. And if you want to see art that expresses cosmic consciousness, oh, my God, you have to see George's paintings and Bill's sculptures. All of George's paintings are, um, are most of them have, have um, 
um, what do I want to say, sacred ge geometry in them. He's going to talk about that. So at 1130 on campus, George and Bill um, Holman will be here, their brothers, talking about their beautiful, the beautiful art. And Bill will be talking about his amazing, amazing staffs, sculptures that come out of his um yeah, amazing, amazing consciousness. So they're going to be talking about that from 1130 to 12. And then at 12, we have a fabulous event here on campus painting a new picture. So if you're in Dallas and you can come, it's going to be outdoors. It's an opportunity for us ex to express our creativity and the abundance of creativity in the universe um, and paint a new picture. It's part of our Adventures in Spirit um, Prosperity campaign painting a new picture uh, so join us for that oh my goodness it's really going to be beautiful and especially it's such a beautiful day to be outside under our tree here in dallas so thanks for joining us this morning and i will look forward to seeing you through all of that um, or i'll look forward to seeing you next week bye for now <laughs>